So welcome back to our second panel addressing the ways to address accelerating industry acceptance and implementation of ISO 15118-20, including plug and charge. And helping make this panel and conference possible is Integrity Security Solutions, also known as ISS. And I'd like to introduce Brian Romansky, who's the G GM for Connected Vehicle Solutions, to provide brief sponsor remarks. Thank you so much, Brian. Thanks, Erica. So yes, I'm Brian Romansky, and ISS might be new to some of you. We're a relatively new member at Charin. Uh, we should be familiar to the OEM members. We have over 20 OEM customers who use our PKI services to provision uh, devices in production today. Uh, we provide services for a lot of different applications. One of them is connected vehicle applications for collision avoidance and uh, cooperative autonomous vehicle and, and V2I inter, 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 interactions. Um, for those V2I, we actually have 18 state DOTs that currently use our PKI services. So we are live issuing certificates to intersections, to traffic lights, to uh, traffic management centers for DOTs today. We've recently set up a uh, ISO 15118 PKI service, so we support Dash 2 and Dash 20, both the, uh, the Prime curve and the Edwards curve under Dash 20. If uh, anybody's interested in standing up a NEVI infrastructure uh, that is future compliant um, with the Dash 20 requirements, we can help you with that. We've actually done a lot of work in configuring HSM's hardware security modules to support the Edwards curve and we have a library that can help implement that. So again, ISO, again, ISS, um, we are uh, ready to support Dash 20 today, and I'm happy to introduce the next panel. Thank you. Fantastic. So uh, on for our panel two, I'd like to introduce Noel Chrysostomo from the U.S. Department of Energy Office of Policy, who's our moderator today, and welcome all of our panelists. Take it away. Morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Noel Chrysostomo, and I'll be moderating. Uh, as folks have been Seeing in the news, the United States has ambitious targets to electrify transportation to reach our necessary climate goals, including a national network of 500,000 chargers and tax credits for new and used electric vehicles. And even recently last month, the EPA proposed a rule to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from cars and trucks that may result in two out of every three vehicles sold in 2032 2032 to be an electric vehicle. And as we've been discussing, the reason we're all here is to realize this vision to deploy chargers and make it easier to drive an electric vehicle. As John and Alex described, the NEVI standard set a new bar for a seamless and convenient national network. But nevertheless, these minimum standards live in an ecosystem of rapid innovation and collaboration to enable new use cases like plug and charge and bidirectional charging. <clears throat> California even has a proposed uh, legislation, SB 233, to enable vehicle to grid now. This will be underpinned by enhanced cybersecurity and a flexible digital infrastructure to interface among charge point operators. And so the goal of this panel is to learn from leaders what's changed from Dash 2 of ISO 15118 to Dash 20, to learn how use cases have evolved and how to navigate a diverse population of vehicles using 70121, Dash 2, and perhaps Dash 20 in the future, and to discuss challenges for implementation requiring more focus and the resources needed to be successful in this rollout. To introduce the differences and uh, benefits of ISO 15118-20 versus Dash 2, we have Dr. Mark Milton from Switch. Uh, you might know him from the Charn Academy. We also have, uh, and Mark, you can uh, transition to your slides if you'd like as I uh, introduce the rest of the panel. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Abdul Haq from Mercedes Benz, Mike Malacuso from Ioteca, and Max Zettel from Electrify America. Mark, take it away. Thanks for the kind intro. Hello, everyone. Um, so, I've 
have the honor now to uh, show you the difference between dash 2 and dash 20 in 10 minutes. I could easily fill an hour with that, so I'll try to be short. Um, I've been uh, involved with ISO 1598 since its very beginning in 2010, and I've been an active contributor to that standard ever since. Um, and I can talk to all the challenges we see when it comes to interoperability, although we have a standard but we do have a lot of um, ambiqui ambiguities in these standards. So, um, long story short, what are the differences between Dash 2 and Dash 20? There are, there is a big common base, but certainly there are a lot of differences. And the new features I would like to start with, for example, in Dash 20, we have everything that Dash 2 has, but additionally bi-directional charging. And, and that is bidirectional energy flow for both AC and DC charging. Um, we have wireless charging. Um, so this is implemented in such a way that we still need a lot of parameters because the, let's say, the technology behind that, the um, alignment for an object detection, all these kind of parameters you need for wireless charging um, is still even on the on the adjacent standard, I think it's IEC 61850, um, is still not 100% clear, I believe, and that's why we have still a lot of parameters in Dash 20, but it's possible. Um, ACD stands for Automated or Automatic Connection Device, and the first implementation is uh, ACD for pantographs, so charging buses via pantographs. Um, that's possible, but it's uh, the standard Dash 20 is set up uh, similar to the changing break that Lonica was talking about when it comes to OCPP 1.6 and 201. We do have a break and change between Dash 20 and, and Dash 2, uh, simply to be more future-proof. So if you have a Dash 2 charging station and a Dash 2, uh, Dash 20 charging station and a Dash 2 vehicle, they are uh, not going to talk to each other if they only support these protocols. Um, they are not backwards compatible, unfortunately. Um, but there are other ACD applications, such as uh, robotic arms, which is probably going to be known as ACD side body or underbody, where you have like a robotic connection device. Uh, similar experience as wireless charging, but um, wired. Um, so these future applications are going to be supported by future versions of Dash 20, and they're still backwards compatible to Dash 20. And what we call a dynamic mode, this uh, feeds into fast responding grid services. Um, there is a mechanism in Dash 2 whereby the charger and the vehicle can negotiate a charging schedule based on certain incentives, such as a, a pricing signal um, and also power signals. But when it comes to fast responding grid services, this may not be fast enough, which is why we introduce a dynamic mode, which is basically making the EV abide by the settings of the charger. The EV is basically more or less a slave to the charger for the benefit of um, providing vehicle to grid services, for example. Stronger cybersecurity. Um, I mean, Dash 2 was published in 2014. The security task force was working on it starting in 2010. We have different cybersecurity assessments uh, 13 years later. So obviously we need to adapt uh, the standard to that as well. Um, one part of that is TLS, which stands for Transport Layer Security, which makes sure that the communication between the vehicle and the charger is digitally encrypted, um, is now mandatory for any use case. In Dash 2, it's only mandatory if you do plug and charge, but if you are authenticating via an RFID card or using a smartphone app, as we discussed before, um, there, TLS is not mandatory in Dash 2, but in Dash 20 it is. Mutual authentication um, in Dash 2, the, the charging station is authentic <clears throat> authenticating itself to the vehicle, um, so the vehicle can trust the charger, but it's not working the other way around, at least not on the TLS, the transport layer. Um, in Dash 20, finally, we have mutual um, authentication, so the vehicle is also authenticating itself towards the charging station, so the charging station can trust the vehicle. Stronger cipher suits, we just heard from the gentleman here that um, he talked about Edwards curve and, and different elliptic curves. For most of you, this probably um, doesn't mean anything. 
um, but he was talking about so-called elliptic curves and there are different strengths and different elliptic curves to make the cyber security even stronger. So we, in Dash 20 we have different so-called cipher suits that define how the vehicle and charger exchange encrypted keys, how they um, digitally sign information and how the information, how the communication channel is encrypted. And last but not least, uh, a dedicated TPM support. TPM stands for Trusted Platform Module. This is a um, kind of like a standard that describes how hardware security modules should work. Essentially, how you are in a very secure way storing your key material inside an embedded device such as an electric vehicle or a charging station. In Dash 20, we have a, dead, we have a, a, a separate chapter on TPM support, giving some guidance on how to implement it. In Dash 2, there's no mentioning of that at all. So we have uh, certain guidance towards TPM in Dash 20. <clears throat> Better support for multiple uh, contracts. Um, there's a slight misconception that in Dash 2, you, it's not possible to have different plug and charge contracts in your vehicle by just by how Dash 2 is designed. That is wrong. It is possible, it's just not, it hasn't been designed in a very straightforward way, but you can still implement it in such a way that you can have different plug and charge contracts in the vehicle. But we made it a bit more explicit in Dash 20. And I want to show you that with a kind of like high level communication between the vehicle and the charging station. On the left hand side, you see how it works in Dash 2. The electric vehicle on the left side is talking to the charging station on the right hand side. And if it does want to do plug and charge and it does not have a digital certificate installed in the vehicle that it needs to present to the charging station to say, hi, I'm, vehicle, uh, I'm a Lucid vehicle, for example, I have a contract from Electrify America, I want to charge at this charging station. Um, if it does not have a contract certificate installed, it will have to install one once it's plugged in. It can ask the charging station to install one. And then the charging station will respond with a certificate installation response, um, so the certificate is installed in the vehicle, if the charger does support certificate installation. Then the car presents that specific plug and charge contract to the charging station, but it may be the case that this charging station operated by, let's say, Electrify America, for the lack of a better example, um, says, sorry buddy, but with this certificate, you cannot charge here because this certificate is only allowed at a charge point charging station, for example. And then you as an EV driver, you're like sitting there <laughs> being super frustrated and like, why? Why is this not working? And in Dash 2, if something goes wrong, it just goes wrong and the communication is game over. There's a fail and that's where it ends. And then you have to restart the communication session and try to do something else. Hopefully, the vehicle manufacturer imp implemented this scenario in such a way that they don't run into the same issue, but maybe try a different um, alternative. When it comes to AC charging, the alternative would be to go back to basic signaling, the PWM signal. Uh, with DC charging, you don't have this alternative. Then, if you do not have an uh, alternative um, contract certificate, then you can only do RVD card or plug and charge. Uh, or, or using an, an app to authenticate. Versus in Dash 20, um, here the car can say, I want to install a contact certificate. Oh, and by the way, I have enough storage space to install maybe up to five or six or two, whatever limit is, um, certificates. So the charging station can then install all the certificates that have been issued for that vehicle. Maybe you as an EV driver, you went to different mo mobility service providers of your choice and signed up for different contracts because that gives you just a wider access to the charging station network. And then once these, in this case, three certificates are installed, the vehicle chooses one, wants to authenticate. Maybe again, it doesn't work at this charging station because there's no roaming agreement between this MSP who issued certificate A and the charging station network provider here. But then the charging station can say, um, sorry buddy, but this is not working here, but maybe try again. You have two other certificates I just installed. Then a car can choose a different certificate and voila, this may work in this case. So there's an, um, like, let's say a graceful degradation 
um, whereby we can still, within the same communication session, try different alternatives. Makes it a bit more smooth for the EV driver. Authorization before service discovery. So the EV and the charging station, they have a certain set of messages. It's a strictly defined conversation uh, whereby you have, you authorize, you ask for, as a, as a vehicle, you ask for different services the charging station offers, you exchange charging parameters, and so on and so forth. In Dash 20, we slightly reversed the order of some messages whereby the vehicle is first authorized before services are offered, which then allows you as a network operator, for example, to um, diff offer specific services. And for that purpose, I've drawn up this, I drew up this um, table to show you what works in Dash 2 and what works in Dash 20. So identification of the vehicle to offer a charging service and value-added services obviously is possible in both. But um, to offer a service based on the type of the customer, is it your own customer that you have a contact with, is it a roaming customer, is it maybe a guest, um, that works better in Dash 2 or only in Dash 2 and not in Dash 20. Uh, sorry, the other way around, Dash 20 and not in Dash 2. And also you can distinguish between types of contracts. Is it a basic or a premium contract? So it has a bit more flexibility as to the business model for you as a charge point operator and mobility service provider. Now this uh, now is the hard part. <laughs> certificates. It's never easy to talk about public key infrastructure, certificates, cryptography, um, without giving you a crash course in that. But I've tried to simplify it as much as I can. There are certain certificates that need to be installed inside vehicle and charging station. And in this example, I'm picking the electric vehicle. Just to give the car manufacturers in this room an idea of how much memory space you need to think about to, to have available for Dash 2 versus Dash 20. So there are certain trust anchors that we need to have installed in both the vehicle and the charging station. We call them V2G root certificates. Um, it's good to have at least two V2G root certificates, either for interoperability, interoperability reasons, because you want to be compatible with different um, PKIs, or because one certificate is soon expiring and you want to have um, a second certificate that will take over. Then you need to have a certificate that we call as 15118 nerds the OEM provisioning certificate because it is used to provision the contract certificate, the plug and charge certificate, into the electric vehicle. And then you have the actual contract certificate from the MSP, the mobility service provider, which comes actually as a chain of certificates with up to three certificates um, to be installed. So in Dash 2, a certificate can have up to 800 bytes maximum. Now we have one, two, three, four, five, six certificates times 800 makes 4.8 kilobytes. Now in Dash 20, we have a few more changes here. The certificate size doubled. Yay. Um, just because we wanted to be able to store a bit more information inside these certificates. Then we introduced the possibility of cross-signing. We talked about interoperability. There are several PKI providers on the market very soon. Right now, Hubject is the only operational one that I know at least, specifically in Europe, but also in the States. Charin is gearing up to become another PKI provider. SAE is doing something in the States as well. So these are at least three different PKI providers. To make sure that we establish interoperability, we need to talk about either cross-signing, I don't want to explain this to you now, this takes way too much time, but just keep this term in your head, or certificate trust lists. These are the most, um, let's say, for straightforward solutions here. But in order to enable that, we need to extend the chain or the maximum length of certificate chains to include a cross-certificate. Also, we have now not just one, so-called elliptic curve to encrypt the communication and to digitally sign information, but we have two. One is a backup, one is a default curve, the other one is a backup curve to be used once the default curve is um, hacked at some point. 
And of course, <clears throat> mutual TLS authentication, so the vehicle also has an additional vehicle certificate that is used to authenticate itself towards the charging station. Now in Dash 20, this is the kind of certificates we had in Dash 2, right? Now the OAM certificate, the charger certificate for provisioning the contract is a little bit more extended. We send now the full chain from the vehicle to the charger. We have this new vehicle certificate chain to do the mutual authentication. And we have this cross certificate. So now we have 12 certificates. In worst case, up to 1,600 bytes, which means all of a sudden we don't have 4.8 kilobytes, but we have to store 19.2 kilobytes, which to us may sound like, who cares? I mean, kilobytes, come on. But when you talk to car manufacturers, they are always whining about the amount of kilobytes they need to store for certificates. And um, just to make sure they get it right, the memo right from the beginning, be aware you have to store a bit more certificates. But this is just for the default curve, right? There's the backup curve. So all in all, we have twice 19.2 kilobytes that you need to be aware. OK, nerd talk over. But I just wanted to make sure that those who want to be aware of this are aware of it. If you want to dive deeper into this whole topic, I do regular trainings uh, through Charn Academy. The next one is coming up end of June. There's a basic training and there's an advanced training. The advanced part is all about plug and charge. Each of those trainings is eight hours long, seven to eight hours. So I divide it up into two times four hour training slots per training. And as you can imagine, we go really deep. So if you want to become a master in fifth level eight, that's a chance. And one last note, if you allow me a little bit of, of uh, self-advertising here, but it's more of the purpose of getting everyone aware you don't have to implement it yourself. At least not everything. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. The same as laptop manufacturers don't, you know, they don't reinvent Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, they buy it from a chip manufacturer. So we do, we provide our own open source implementation of ISO 1508-2 and dash 20. We call it Joseph. Um, here's the GitHub code in the QR code. Um, happy for anyone who wants to pick this up, um, try it out. If you come across any issues, please provide um, in, you know, this issue reports on the GitHub page and we're happy to work towards resolving these as soon as possible. The open source part of Joseph is only related to ISO 15.11.8, but the professional version also includes OCPP 2.0.1 and 2.1, which is going to come up this year as well. That's the end of it. I'm happy to tell you more about um, what we offer or, or the training or about 15.11.8 and plug and charge. So hit me up. This is my QR code on LinkedIn. And um, thanks, Mark, for the crash course. Let's now hear from automakers, charging networks, and controllers, uh, manufacturers, to see how they're navigating this evolution of use cases, starting with Mohammed. Can you speak about how Mercedes-Benz architecture has evolved with these two standards? Uh, yeah, I th thanks, Mark, for uh, the detailed uh, technical course here. I think Mercedes, just like I think most of OEMs are working on developing the standard, including ISO 15118. I think we've seen that there's a lot of technologies that's been enabled since the last 13 years, as, as Mark has indicated. I think we, we need to continue to look at those enabling technologies also to uh, understand how we can bring in this uh, seamless uh, charging experience that is also secured, and touched on security as well, um, in the hands of the customers. Um, so I think what, I, what we see here in this slide is, is really uh, just the, maybe a, a repeat of what Mark already uh, captured in details is that the vehicle uh, th theoretically would be enabled actually to support a multi-PKI uh, environment, specifically talking about uh, open free market. I think in the first panel discussion this morning, that would be enabled. Of course, that brings in a little bit of uh, additional technologies that would be required from memory size, for example, on a vehicle. Um, but um, that would be theoretically or conceptually enabled within the vehicle. 
um, as long as, of course, we do have uh, two of the essential functions across uh, the uh, charging, multiple charge point operators, in this case, the trusted of the mobility root certificates, as well as the roaming capabilities uh, across uh, the uh, charge point operators backends as well. That those are two key enablers for a successful uh, launch of, of the uh, primarily roaming services within, within a vehicle. And again, I want to go back to what was earlier said. I think that's only possible, I think, through this open communication. We talk specifically in regards to reliability. Uh, but we need, you know, reliability and it needs that we have an open, trusting uh, communication. I think this is also, again, what we see here in, in, um, in this slide. So, Max, turning to you, given that EA is able to plug and charge with Mercedes-Benz cars, but a number of other vehicles as well, can you talk about how you're handling vehicles that are trying to speak Dash 20, may in the future be speaking Dash 2, or, sorry, speak dash 22 today, 20 in the future, but also uh, legacy vehicles within. Thank you, Noel, and thank you, Mark, for the good introduction to dash 20, which gives a very good overview. The challenge for us is there's legacy vehicles out there which will never be able to do dash 2, never dash 20. They don't have the memory or they can be OTA upgraded. The customers just don't take them to the dealership. So as a CPO, I have to be able, or we have to be able there's a legacy vehicle that supports only DIN. So we, for years to come, we will have to support DIN vehicles. Then we have Dash 2 vehicles out, which might not be able to support the additional memory that will stay on Dash 2 for years to come. So we have already those two standards. And if certificate fails, how do we handle this exception case? Do we fall back? It's similar because in the end, we need to allow the customer to use a normal um, external payment app or worst case credit card and then in the future we have dash 20 so for a CPO the challenge will be how do we support all three of those in the same charger and ensure interoperability and in the first step when a vehicle plugs in to ask him what language are you speaking then dash 2 or dash 20 that's one of the challenges as I see will be for CPOs the critical and of course the, mini, mini, the equipment manufacturers will be a big challenge there Thanks, and, and Mike, um, Mark was talking about enhanced security. Can you kind of unpack what that means from the perspective of, of a charge controller uh, and diagnostics manufacturer? Sure, so maybe the first thing to talk a little bit about is dash two to dash 20, the evolution, right? So we, you know, Mark mentioned uh, earlier that when dash two was, the work started was 2010 or so, um, and we're now, you know, 13, 14 years later in the future, and when we're now, we, one of the things that we're adding into Dash 20 is all of the learnings, right? If you, if you look at how many EVs were on the market when Dash 2 started to be, uh, to be written, right? Not as many, certainly, as today. There's a significant number of learnings that we've added. So besides adding features, and to get your, to your question on security, uh, security has advanced significantly. So. One of the things, for example, in Dash 20, where there's a dedicated chapter on TPM support. So TPM is a trusted platform module. It's hardware-based security. It's much more secure than doing it you know, in a software-only environment. And although many implementations use that on their Dash 2 solutions, um, our products do as well. But for Dash 20 going forward, it now makes that more common and give some better recommendations so the industry can really fully adopt this uh, this secure solution and if you look to you know all of the advances in in cybersecurity necessitated the need for the change of the encryption curves because there's more uh, attacks that have been found on the on TLS for example 1.1 and this is the same technology that's used in your browsers right uh, and is used in banking transactions that's state-of-the-art so really it's an update it's an update to later standards and it's not easy but it's not terrifying because all of this uh, all of this has existed and has been running for years and we talked about PKI we never even probably even thought about a PKI before, but every time you go to open your web browser and go to a website, you go to your bank, you see a little 
key that says this has been secured. Well, that's through a PKI. That's through a, a, uh, a way that the industry acknowledges and can digitally verify where that transaction came from and where that you're actually talking to your bank. And that's exactly what we're doing in plug and charge and what we're doing in uh, advancing the security in Dash 20 is that we're enabling that same level of security so that you can be confident in, in that transaction. Yeah, thank you for uh, kind of making this less scary as a, as a policymaker. I'm certainly not an expert in PKI, but uh, putting in, in those terms helps kind of ground what Mark was describing. So I'm interested in who's in the room. Uh, we have three types of stakeholders here, OEMs, charging manufacturers, charge controllers, developers, and software. Um, and so we have a poll. I'd encourage folks to open up their phone and go to the schedule, hit the session, uh, our panel two, and take the poll to see uh, who is in the room. What is your affiliation? Can we go to the results? On my side, I'm seeing 33% charging hardware and software. In second place, 22% automotive manufacturer. And then about even between utilities and charging hardware, or utilities and charging software. Um, and so this is kind of leading into the next question. As you heard the stories from uh, experience at Mercedes-Benz and Aeroteca uh, and switch in EA. Oh, wow, it's changed a little bit. So hardware and software and OEM roughly evenly split and almost equal among the others. Great, so welcome again. Um, and if you could go to the next question after hearing these uh, stories from these stakeholders, uh, what is your company's current implementation pathway? We heard legacy implementation of DIN without 15.11.8, DIN with dash two and only, but not yet 15.11.8 dash 20, skipping dash two, and then lastly, all four, all three. So an overwhelming uh, amount of folks doing all three. That's Great to hear. Uh, so that kind of raises the next uh, set of questions can, that we have. Can we, for, can we comment on yeah, that? Of course. So I find, I find it curious that there are not an insignificant amount of companies or representatives thinking about skipping dash two. I would be wary about that because again, interoperability, there are a lot of chargers or cars out there that have dash two that will maybe not as quickly upgrade to Dash 20. And then if you bring your products to the market with Dash 20 support, then your customers will be disappointed because at those Dash 2 chargers, they can charge. So I understand the urge to be efficient with where you put your resources, but skipping Dash 2 is not a good idea. Um, let's get rid as quickly as possible, please, of this freaking DIN spec because that was never supposed to survive such long. And let's not work on any revisions on this. Please, please, please. Let's focus on Dash 20 and Dash 2. So I heard, I saw some reactions, and everyone has done Dash 2 on this panel. So let's hear. So just from, from my point of view, you know, I just want to echo some of the comments on everything we've been talking about so far today, right? The first panel talking about uh, some of the issues that we're seeing and some of the the problems and how we deal with them and then how we measure uptime and how we measure the performance. Well, moving to the later versions of the standard and taking advantage of the evolutions that have been added and the issues that have been resolved, the clarifications, certainly would make that a lot easier. So I echo a lot of uh, what Mark is saying there. Yeah, I can also second that. It's really moving to the later standard will help. but. Um, several in this room have implemented plug and charge either 15 and dash 2 with us. 
And we always had discussion. We are standard conform, or we too, but there is still work to be done with the testing symposium that's happening tomorrow. Testing and then perhaps do refinements, especially on the limits, on the timings and other things to improve the standards because there is still, and then yet, as discussed in the first panel, there is not yet a testing device out for a dash two. How can I say I'm dash two compliant? It's basically up to own judgment or by your customers you implement it. If, and the second that you should go for dash two first and then dash 20. And I agree if we can get rid of DIN, I'm supporting that. But at the moment, DIN, just to say that, is our safe fallback. If anything doesn't work with dash two, we fall back on DIN because there we know it works because TLS might fail. There is no contract, no certificate. If we enforce that, then the customer gets stranded. And that's what no one of us wants. In the end, it goes to might not be the best experience, but they need to get their energy to be able to move on. Hamid. Uh, also see it the same way. I think um, for those who have been developing these products, we saw in Olex timeline, you know, the DIN and ISO 1508-2 and now recently Dash 20. For those who have been developing these products it's 10 years ago, let's say, they needed to develop a product that's Dash 2 compatible. And obviously, as the technology is enabling us to, to have a more seamless experience, more uh, a safe experience for charging, uh, ultimately, we want to integrate those, those technologies in, in those standards and enable us that jump into the future. Um, and, and that's why I'd like to add that maybe Dash 20 is what we know is the best maybe today, but what are we going to learn 10 years from now, 20 years from now? If, if I look at the, you know, where we come from as an internal combustion engine, we were still developing technologies in internal combustion engine side for more than 100 years, the, the engine has existed. So I think, I, I, I believe we should all applaud ourselves for, as a community, where we, we came all together for the last 10 years, but we still have hopefully a lot, lot more to, to, to be done as an open, transparent community. Yeah, thank you for participating in the app and the polls. This is perhaps a first census that we can continue with future annual events. Um, kind of shifting gears to this further progression, further effort and focus needed for implementation. Um, Mark, you were mentioning open source software available from Switch. Um, I'm wondering if you and Mike uh, can kind of compare and contrast the approaches for open software versus uh, proprietary software from Iotecha that s several folks are using. I, <clears throat> so the, maybe the, the reason why we do open source software is um, because I've seen a, a lot of bad implementations over the years. My first testing symposium was in 2014. And 10 years later or nine years later, I see similar mistakes being done over and over again. So in order to avoid these reinventing the wheel mentality, we need to go the open source route in order to create interoperability between the cars and the chargers. Um, we implement both sides, but we focus on the, uh, more on the charger side when it comes to testing it in, in a commercial product. Um, but the, the make versus buy decision, especially specifically for charger manufacturers, 1508, DINSPEC, this is commodity software very soon. This is not a differentiating factor for you. You need to think about how you build your value added services on top of a functional software stack that is bulletproof, that is tested, and that's how you differentiate yourself, apart from beautifully and reliable chargers. But thinking that you should invest money and time and, and manpower into developing your own stack is misguided, in my opinion. That's why open source is extremely important to get this industry forward and to improve the user experience. Mike, your response. Yes. So, I mean, for, for me, I think what's most important is to look that there are many different options. There's many different ways to go. There's, um, it's great that there's more open source uh, software becoming available to allow companies that want to engage on some of their own development. There is controller manufacturers, self-promoting, IOTech is one of them. There's products from Vector, from, you know, from, from various other companies that do, this, that do very similar things. But the point is we really need to embrace the interoperability. And that's why we're here, right? That's why you know, we're here at this festival. We're here to test, to make sure that things are operating, 
together. And really, to me, the most important thing is having all of having the options um, to to make buy, make halfway, uh, or you know, do it yourself. But uh, you know, that will certainly impede some of the the progress on interoperability a bit until we get more, as you're we talking earlier in one of the panels, the more formal testing uh, processes in place. Because once more formal testing processes are in place and there's very strict protocol conformance guidelines and very strict testing that can be done, then we're in a much different, you know, environment. Because what we need to deal with, and, uh, you know, I think uh, um, Max certainly talked to this a little bit about what they've seen on the charging network is every vehicle behaves differently. Every charger behaves differently. There's always something that's different. So adhering to a standard is fantastic, but also working is, 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 is more important. So there are certain liberties that need to be taken. So those things need to be managed uh, together. And the more sources that there are of implementations, the more they're tested, the better off the whole industry is going to be. Max, I wonder if you can jump in and discuss the business case and yeah, partnerships. Just one comment on that. He's right. There's, as I said before, everyone says I'm standard compliant. There's just one test suit for DIN out that Charm provides for Dash 2. There's nothing where you can say this is, I do this test suit and I'm standard compliant. For Dash 20, there's not even a test standard written yet, just to say like that. So I can implement easily say I'm compliant because no one can charge am I. It's just between the CPO at the moment or the charge machine and the vehicle, they need to be interoperable. The more we standardize this, the better. But in the end, it comes all down to some kind of business case between the CPO machine operator and the vehicle OEM. Because in the end, it, we transfer energy which costs more or less money on the market. Of course, we try to go more renewable energy, but in the end, it's a business case. We need to, the CPO needs to pay to the utilities. The, the customer needs to pay to us. So, however, it is. So that's in what we shouldn't forget. While well, we try to interoperate and get this stuff, needs to be something that works as a business case for everyone in the industry. Can I just? I forgot to add a, th um, a thought on two topics. One is a certification and. Being compliant is great, but um, being certified gives the end customer more of a, you know, um, you feel more secure that your product is really going to work with certified products. And we heard from Lars Bech that ISO 1500 2 is, there is no certification program out there yet, but I believe they're going to have it ready by the end of this year. For OCPP 201, there is a certification out there. Um, they are opening it in June. Um, the open source software, Joseph, is going to be certified for OCPP 201 in June as well. And we are, as soon as the ISO 1508 2 certification program is out, we're going to make sure that this is certified as well. So, again, open source software can save you a lot of pain and time and money and focus on something that is really making sure that you are um, differentiating yourselves. The way I see it, Everyone in the industry needs to look for what's my differentiating factor between my competitor. This stuff, the way I see it, shouldn't be the differentiating factor. It's like coming out of the automotive industry in Europe, there's Autosar, a rich consortium of a lot of OEMs and other companies that join together the right standards for CAN, for eSenate and other things, which basically, this is our standard, those are our chipsets that doesn't differentiate them. They all want to get in the end to a better quality at a better economy of scale for this. And I think that's where this industry needs to go as well. Yeah, yeah. I think I definitely agree with what we just heard. I think the, the, the reason for a standard is to have it an open standard. And if you have a lot of, a lot of the learnings already implemented and understood in a standard that agreed upon to be an open standard, for me, in my mind, that's an open source code. If it's software, we're talking about software specifically, which means increased reliability, which means maybe probably reduced cost, which means none, uh, no need for re-engineering or reinventing the wheel, as I heard the terminology. So ultimately, it is in the best interest of all of the uh, EV customers, which I think what we all have a com as a common objective here. It looks like there's an emerging theme of differentiation being a challenge to standardization. Um, and combining the earlier poll, we only have 10% uh, of the attendees representing the utilities sector. 
Uh, Max, during our prep call, you'd mentioned one of the challenges to rolling out infrastructure is uh, the challenges in grid codes uh, and implementing charging networks. So could you speak to how utilities might uh, consider more consistent adoption of these technologies? Um, just to say it like that, I'm not on our field service expert, but just supporting it with hardware. Just to go on, if you look in a charger, there's more behind just the charger. There's power electronics behind it. Then in the US, you always have some kind of disconnect switch or switch gear behind it. Then depending where in the US you are, you need to have a metering compartment in it or not, then it's specified. So just in this is three regions, and then you might from there go into local code where you say what's allowed in one county is not allowed in the other one. This is really going by utility to utility. It's really difficult to say what is allowed. In some states, a CPU is not allowed to sell energy by the kilowatt hour. We have to sell by time because we are not a utility. Just to give you this wide aspect where you say if you want to really participate in the grid, there's far more standardization needed in the U.S. than we, what we do with the communication layer that is established here. And Mark, I know you've been a long-time advocate for engaging with utilities and grid codes, specifically yeah. for vehicle-to-grid. So can you talk about your recent uh, thoughts and work on Dash 20? So Dash 20, um, fortunately, it allows bidirectional charging or specifies it concretely in messages. Um, so both AC and DC is possible, um, but there are different layers of bi-directional charging, right? You can have bi um, vehicle to home, vehicle to building, vehicle to grid. When it comes to vehicle to grid, it gets a whole lot more complicated because that's when you need to talk to the utilities, that's when you need to abide by what Noel mentioned, grid codes, which is a set of, let's say, requirements, how a device such as a solar inverter or a battery in a car or inverter in a car is allowed to push back energy into the grid. And in Dash 20, we have kind of like a minimum set of um, requirements and, and messages that allow bidirectional charging even to the grid, but it only enables it really for DC. When it comes to AC, it gets more complicated because the inverter sits inside the vehicle and not inside a stationary charging station. So the vehicle roams around, right? Today it can be in California, next day it's in um, neighboring state <laughs> or in Germany, we have France and Germany and Netherlands and whatever. Um, different states have different grid codes. Uh, even within the states you may have different grid codes. So we need to um, enable Dash 20 to make sure it is pushing the relevant parameters down to the vehicle through Dash 20 so the vehicle can abide by those grid codes, the relevant ones, and be certified together with the charging station as a distributed energy resource so it can do vehicle to grid. So there's a lot of work to be done. Next week in New Jersey there's a, a joint working group meeting for ISO 15118 that uh, I and my colleague Andre, he, who sits back in the room, will attend and we have some ideas on how we can make it happen with some colleagues who are um, real experts on grid codes. And this is hopefully, as far as I know, going to be resolved through an amendment of Dash 20, so we don't need a new version of the standard, which takes years. So my hope is that within a matter of months, we can get that done. Mohammed, is Yeah, I, I think, again here, uh, I think I heard in the morning that you know, it's, it's possible to converge on, on a vehicle side, on a charging station side, but it's going to be difficult to converge on the utility side. But why not? I'll ask. You know, we're in a completely new world. You know, why shouldn't we ask that question to our utility partners and whatever decisions they made in the past? Can they reconsider those decisions to enable us also, again, bringing in the economies of scale in the best interest of the customer? So the good thing about the app is that Mohammed's question doesn't need to be hypothetical with no response. There's actually a discussion section in uh, the bottom panel. You'll see four people next to each other. If you click that and click, again, this panel two's section, you can freeform explain uh, what you think utilities should do to accept these technologies or how to support interconnection or develop software. So, Welcome you to uh, provide your thoughts there. 
Um, and to use our last 10 minutes, um, we want to hear from our panelists and you guys in the comment section what resources and actions are needed. How can we use the annual uh, testable to make Nevi real, make Dash 20 real, et cetera. And so building off of uh, Alex's and John's discussion around the National Charging Consortium and the work of the labs, um, invite this panel to discuss what are the next critical steps. There was mention in uh, working groups, uh, the need for conformance first, ongoing interoperability testing, and even a around the clock, bigger than DECRA uh, and CEC Vigil Lab to allow for this such testing and public education. So I'm wondering, um, what would you like to emphasize first? There's one thing I forgot to mention, um, especially for those engineers who are implementing and testing ISO 15118, we have a user group, an ISO 15118 user group where if you come across an ambiguity in a standard or something is wrong or you don't understand the reason behind it, um, there's a user group under the URL, and unfortunately I forgot to include it in my slides, iso 15118elad that's E-L-A-A-D dot I-O, where we exchange our ideas of how do we improve the current specification and these uh, improvements, these user tickets are then going to be used as a source for the next revision of that standard. That's how we did it back with Dash 2 and we revived that user group now for Dash 20. And please, if you are an engineer testing, implementing a standard, please sign up to that user group and provide your input. It is helping the whole community. Mohammed, can I ask you uh, for your thoughts on how adhering to standards makes interoperability easier? I think it's not just easier, it's, it's essential. I think that's what we have as a cross community, um, as a guiding book. I mean, these standards is really what's enabling us to not invent a full ecosystem, but really work across organization to make this happen. And uh, specifically, if we're also enabling this way of thinking across the globe, Imagine the benefits of these economies of scales when uh, also I heard earlier is like when I don't have to invent a, a specific solution um, for charging just for for the US, but I can take also my car between the US and Europe, in this case maybe for me in Germany, and be able to uh, transfer those vehicles across the continents and uh, still have a single working seamless experience. Again, I don't want, even as a customer, I don't want to go to to a visit uh, to, to, to Europe and uh, find out how I'm going to be able to charge uh, between uh, here and maybe in, in, in Europe or across the rest of the world. I think at the end of the day, we all can converse around the, the world. I think it's, from a customer perspective, I would see a great benefit with that. Yeah, I, I'm recalling a Argonne National Lab slide from many years ago providing the vision for global interoperability where any car can any any car can plug in to any charger anywhere anytime and it works seamlessly without any special effort from the user. Max, can you talk about how that has been challenged in practice? Uh, not not blaming on EA it, um, by any means. No, it's I think Lars brought this British example up in the first thing. There is a there's people out there that are not standard compliant. What do I do? Do I support them or do I strengthen this customer? That's effectively what I do. If I do not support this vehicle being outside of standard, this customer does not charge with my charger. There's no way I can support him. And we know we have implemented several ways a little bit closer around the standard, extending here, extending here, to support vehicles which are just not in standard or came out just with the standard so they were working for earlier version not to criticize so there's really going for more standard conform implementation and developing the testing with it that both sides can test against it like usb phones they use so many interfaces which are standardized no one thinks about that oh that's 
does this cable work with my phone? If it's, as long as it's the same interface, it works. And that's where we need to get. I think all the standardization work, the testing work that's ongoing will help us get there. In the meantime, for adaption, I think we also need to look a little bit at our customer, the driver. If you talk to a customer, average customer in a charging station, unless they have it, to talk, they haven't talked to enough people where the weak line no can do plug and charge, what do they use their credit card? They do not even know that with the buying of the vehicle, they get certain benefits on our network. There is an education gap for really the people who buy the car or our call center on a daily basis gets calls from people. I now have this electric car. What do I do? I'm at your charging station. That's something like there is, whatever we do, we need to work, bring the customer along with us and then they will also ask for, I want to have plug and charge and all those things. This is why we need to drive it to the customer and at the same time establish, enable our technology and our charges to support it. Then. So Mike, I'm wondering if you can build upon what Lonica was saying uh, with respect to testing and making it broadly available and uh, accessible for these hardware manufacturers and automakers to, to use to make sure that their conformed equipment is able to interoperate quickly. Yes, yeah, so I think there's a few things that we need to really talk about. So, you know, to build first a little bit on what Max was saying, when you're talking about compliant and conformant devices, you're not necessarily talking about devices that will work. Right. So this is the this is the first thing that we that we need to really embrace a little bit when we talk about our conformance testing, because if you do, you know, speaking from the EVSC side, right, if you do build a charger that conforms 100 percent to the standard and implements all the timeouts and all the settings and everything exactly as written in the standard, you will charge maybe five percent of the vehicles that that are on the road. So. What you really need to do, what we really need to look at is how do we take this from a conformance point of view and extend our conformance testing to include, let's say, the idiosyncrasies of all of the deployed hardware, wherever it happens to be. Because to me, this is really what's going to be very important in order to advance everything so you can have a certified device that will be not only have a stamp of approval, but also be functional. Uh, so every time 100% you plug in, it will work. Because from my point of, from our point of view at IOTECA, we've most of our activity is finding creative ways to make things work when everything is not 100% that we're talking to standards compliant or not conforming to every piece. Not putting any implementation down for you know, but because there were no the, there were none of these conformance activities formalized when the, when the products were put into the market, this is just something we need to deal with as an industry and we need to find the best way to do it. And that's really, to me, really what's most important to move forward. So moving forward, I'm wondering if Max and Mark can talk about the challenges and opportunities with operating a test lab and the concept for a bigger 24-hour Vehicle Grid Innovation Lab, building off of the CEC's good work. Max? <clears throat> can, can I just comment on, on that uh, thing? This, what you just said, uh, reminds me of actually a, a sentence that I heard from, I think it's the CEO of, of Campower that I heard on, on your podcast, Kyle. Uh, he said, um, we have a famous saying in our company, do you want the charger to be compliant or do you want it to work? And it's, it's actually true, right? It's, you, you, unfortunately, there is hardware out there. You, you want to make it work for the benefit of your customers. But I want to stress, uh, want to stress the importance of over-the-air updates. It cannot be that we have to adhere to all these, for, you know, that this is an, an ever-ongoing thing that you have to implement software and all these hacks to abide by all these different idiocracies of, of versions. We have to convert to a common understanding. Um, with legacy hardware, maybe over the updates are not a thing when we talk about 2014, 2015 vehicles, but going forward, this should be possible, I think. And yeah, a 24-7 test lab would be amazing, definitely. I know that Elad has a test lab that's always available, that's great, in uh, Arnhem, in the Netherlands. If we had more of those test labs in different geographies, um, would be wonderful. 
Max, can you share your experience about Virginia? Well, we have a test lab at Electrify America, and I know several people have been there. And it's great to come in, have OEMs there test, and judge and tell us also hey, where your implementation might not be right or do that thing, but it's basically our business. It belongs to our network, and I know EVGO and others have similar things where they do interoperability testing because we want to know does this thing work with our station? It's for us and for us and all, it's our interest. I have this customer who will put charge with us. I want to make sure it works, but this is also going beyond. And of course, it's a big investment. Um, we haven't looked completely at a business case, how can we make this really publicly available, but in the first case it's there to support our business, but we can look into how can we make it available 24-7 might be a little bit difficult because at a certain point also the smartest engineer needs to sleep, but um, we can look into it, but it's not something, especially with all the high power charges and all these things, it's not something that's cheap to implement and set up. You need to talk with utilities, get the right space, set it up. and. It's challenging, but doable. Mohammed, what are your thoughts on this, this question? I think I agree to what I just heard. Is uh, it's very hard to quantify the benefit of of, a, of the testing lab. But in my opinion, if we're getting an opportunity to test in an environment internally, if it's a testing lab, or if we we heard specifically at the Electrify America's charging network, that's an opportunity for us as engineers to find those issues that ultimately an EV customers would face. And we start looking at, you know, what the issue is and how to resolve it there and then, not as we heard earlier from Lucid, it's like, is it a charger problem? Is it a vehicle problem? Is it a network problem? At the time where we're really trying to serve the final customer. Second to the last point from Max. And just not to forget, and a universal interop lab, but it's not to be forgotten, especially with all this chain here. It's not just the charger. The charger talks to a CPO, talks to an MSP, to the certificate authority, to perhaps an OEM. So interoperability is not just I can talk to this charger and get to this stage. In the end, my contract needs to be valid. I need to be enrolled there. So this is a step which also no one should forget that customer needs to go to enrollment and only all that together makes it interoperable to say, I can enroll here, I can charge, all these things. And that's why the labs is also vital for companies like us to have, because it's the complete customer experience with us that needs to work. I really appreciate everyone's shared thoughts and welcome further discussion in the chat and during coffee. Uh, but really call, want to conclude with a call to action such that we're able to meet our nation's electrification targets and zero emission transportation targets as quickly and easily for customers as possible. So we look forward to continued work with Charin and enjoy the rest